Hey everybody, it's David R. Becker here with another Becker R. Tip. And today's tip is going to be, actually it's kind of a photographer's thing that us um, artists can actually use. And it's called the Circle of Confusion. <laughs> and so I know it's a weird thing. I just learned about this about a month ago and I have been using this and I didn't even know what the name of it was for a long time. And so if you look at what these images right here, those are circle of confusion circles. <laughs> and so um, it's basically something that's done with um, the focal point and the, the um, camera's focal depth of field. And that happens um, with the camera and because of the lens. And yes, it's not so much an artist thing, but photographers use this all the time to make things out of focus. There is a good explanation to it that um, I watched on YouTube and I'm just gonna let you see this image for yourself because it's a lot easier for the, you to see. So go to this website, um, kineticimage.com and I'm gonna just run it really quickly for you, to, you guys to see um, what this is actually about. Um, it's a very interesting, I found it very interesting to um, see what causes those circles to be that way. So let me just run this really quick and um, I'll get my face out of here and so you can actually see it. And we'll take that out of there for a second and just run the video. I'm Richard Claybaugh and this is the Kinetic Image. Many people feel the circle of confusion is aptly named because it's not always very well understood. But here's a simplified explanation. Take any point of light from in front of the lens. Light from that point passes through the lens and is bent to a matching point behind the lens. That point of convergence, where the beams come together and cross each other, is called the focal point. When the focal point falls exactly on the focal plane, which is the flat surface behind the lens where the camera's film or light sensor is located, that subject is in sharp focus. Light from different distances in front of the lens comes to convergence at different distances behind the lens. When you're adjusting focus, what you're actually doing is changing the point behind the lens where light from different distances comes to convergence. Looking at this a little bit more three-dimensionally, you can see these lines actually define the edges of a cone of light. When the point of that cone is on the surface of the focal plane, it makes a dot that's as small as it can be. But watch what happens as we rack through the focus. The point of convergence moves off the focal plane and we see a larger slice of the cone. The dot grows into a circle, very much like the street lights are doing behind me right now. When you rack back the other direction, you pass through the focal point, and now you're in the part of the cone where the light diverges. You get a circle again, and the whole thing looks on screen very much like what you're seeing happening behind me right now. The measurement of where a point of light grows to a circle you could actually see in the final image is called the circle of confusion and it's actually measured in fractions of a millimeter on the surface of the target area. That number is what's used to calculate depth of field tables. Different media have different circles of confusion, and that's what defines what we call in or out of focus. So, <laughs> so you see right there, I, I saw this, I saw this on, um, and it really um, inspired me to think of how, what the reasoning was, why those circles are being made. And, and it actually shows you the depth of field. What I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks is losing your image or losing your, um, losing edges, losing edges and making things out of focus. And that's the depth of field. And so this is one way then to show that depth of field and make things out of focus. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and just show you that these things on my on these paintings and this is actually an image right here this is a photo and that's just taken um, with the depth of field so everything is out of focus and so uh, anything that's a light like especially Christmas lights they could be out of focus that are in the distance back here and so that's really kind of neat that you can use that to make things out of focus even though it's a hard edge but it shows things out of focus and that's what a lens does um, and again, you probably would not see this if you're painting live, but since we sometimes are using photographs and we do have different styles, why not use the, um, the circle of confusion circles? And that's what I did on this one with the parrot. I just use it. And now to get this, I'm going to show you really quickly how to get those images to get that, um, the circle of confusion circles. 
So let's go over to our, not to my website, to my tabletop here. <laughs> so let's get my thing out of there. And so here I had I had an image and it's kind of, kind of a um, background that just, it's out of focus, but I, I felt like, oh man, you know what? We can maybe make this um, look a little bit more interesting. Like there are lights back there. And so they get the circles of confusion kind of things into this. And it's almost like what we've been doing with stencils giving the background some stencil work and some interest, but not making it so contrasty that you um, want it to look too much like it's in the foreground. And so the circle of confusion um, circles are actually excellent to make it still um, using hard edges. And I, I use a stencil that I made out of stencil material. It's a plastic you can get at most art stores. I've got this one at Hobby Lobby and I took a compass um, knife and you can just um, also, just take an exacto knife, and they have to be perfectly used circles. You know, if they're off a little bit, that's fine. If you can find, like, I think you can probably go to Stencil Girl, StencilGirlProducts.com, and you can probably find some circles too. Um, there's probably things in Hobby Lobby too that are circle templates, or even um, circles that you can make with like a bottle of something, and then just roll around it, and just cut it out out of paper. You don't actually need that plastic. And actually, I'm gonna find. I'm gonna try to experiment with ways of maybe not even having to use a stencil, but just using other ways of making a circle by with your brush and just rolling out. So, so here's the a stencil I made. And all I do is I can do it in two ways. I can either spray white paint onto that, or this is a watercolor so I can take it out. And so I want to take it out and I'm going to, I usually like to have the circles of, of confusions, the same size because usually that's what's happening in there, but it doesn't have to be because there are going to be different lights in your image that are a little bit brighter and less bright. And so they can be smaller and larger. I tend to find that I, when I'm doing it, I like to have them all the circles the same size. So I'm taking a magic eraser, Mr. Clean magic eraser, and I get all the water out as much as possible. And then I just rub, I w wipe away my circle, my paint that's on the, on the paper, I just wipe it away. I have my towel on my, on my working surface so I can just rub that down. And again, try not to use too much water. You cannot use too much water in here. And then since it's out of focus, the dog's ear um, should be in focus, but I can go over a little bit to give it a little bit of a look like maybe the edge is out of focus. And so I'm gonna go all the way around and I always hold it when I lift it up, I always hold it in place just because you never know if you did it right. So I'll, go, I'll look at it first. I go, okay, that's good enough. Maybe I'll go a little bit on the top here, get a little bit more on the top. And so that's one circle. And so then we'll do another one. And when you go to the next one, wipe it off. Wipe it off on both sides because you don't want to put dirty, you know, dirty wash onto the nice surface you got there. I also like to overlap it once in a while so that the circles of confusion are overlapped a little bit. And I never knew this what this was called either until a couple of weeks ago when we were um, when I had done it on another on the on a paint along that I did where I used this circle template and that was in that the Christmas tree one the Christmas thing I was in I'm just gonna wipe this out here a little bit there's two and maybe I'll put a small one right here again I'm just rubbing really lightly and then with a very very damp. It's just a very damp sponge. I don't need to. I'm going to try because I, I heard that I, well, my student said that they used a brush and they take all the water out and then they just rub it a little bit with the brush too. And that's a way of doing it too. Again, you want to do it really lightly. Actually, this one is the dog's head. So I'm going to scrub that out a little bit. Again, this is a way of getting hard edges in your work, but still making it look like it's out of focus. Because that's what the, that's what these circles of confusion are. It, there are lights that are back there. Maybe this is like um, you know a bunch of lights back there, and then so now I'm just rubbing with my brush, and then maybe pay, pay, take paper towel, put that, and then just blot where you had done that, done that too. Where you just blot with paper towel, and brush. That works actually very good too. So, and, and I'm just going to randomly put them around, you know, don't make things even. That's one thing. Actually, I kind of like this where you wet it. 
with a brush a little bit and scumble a little bit with your brush. It's very, excuse me, my brush is just damp. And then I take paper towel and I just wipe it, blot it up. There's another one. Let's get a few on this side. I like to put them behind the dog just because that way you get to look like they're not just all around where they're not, you know, overlapping. Overlapping is another way of showing dimension. And so that's one of those good overlapping ways or good <laughs> dimension, ways of getting dimension in your work is by overlapping. I call that peacock. And one day I have to do a, the whole video on peacock and you know, those are five ways of showing dimension. And one of them is overlapping. And so there we have another one. And that, let me show you how you do the next one um, the different way. So there's also ways of doing it where you add paint. And this is going to be with acrylics or even with watercolors if you don't mind putting white on top of your watercolor. But you see here I have an airbrush here. And this is a portable airbrush. Um, I will put the, put the information about this in the description of the video below. And you can get it on Amazon. That's where I got this one. And you can use it to blow on the on the stencil and then just put it on the white. What I like to use is you can either use watercolor. And to do the watercolor, I just wet it. I wet the white. Let's say I want white. I just wetting over here. As you can see, I'm wetting it. And then I basically put it into my cup here. I just wring it out in my cup. I make it pretty wet because it has to be pretty wet. And I use Chinese white. I don't use, no, I don't use Chinese white. I use titanium white because Chinese white is a transparent white where titanium white is an opaque white. So I use an opaque white because I want to cover the, the surface. So I'm going to go up here and I'm just going to, this one happens to turn on as soon as you press it back with your finger. Other ones have the hoses and nozzles and all that kind of stuff. Um, learn how to use your brush from the instructions that come with it. And then I'm just going to press down and it's going to start shooting out. And then I pull back to let the, the air come forward and it releases my white. And so see, I just put a little white on there. And this is a very easy way of putting white onto the surface. And it makes it also a soft edge. And now this is kind of wet, but because it was sprayed on, it's going to be very fine. And it, though it is going to um, get darker because it's very transparent. Even though this is opaque white, I'm not putting much pigment on there. So I can do another one. Let's do it again. Maybe a little bit smaller. And just laying it down. Put a little bit of white on there. And you can do different, um, different amounts of white that you put on it. And see, I didn't clean it off. And so always clean it off after every, th every time you spray or rub out, you want to take uh, the, the airbrush. Now the airbrush does give you a softer, smoother edge, but again, it all depends on what you want to do. Now look what I did here. It made a mess because it was on my, it was on my stencil. And so again, always, always, always wash the bottom of your stencil before you go over in. And so that's with watercolor. Now you can also do it with acrylic and Holbein makes an acrylic ink, um, acrylic ink. And so this is super opaque white. And so this is ink and it's actually used for airbrushes and also just to paint with like a watercolor I've used it for. And so you just take your, um, your airbrush and you just put it in there and just do it like you did the water and white. I like the water, uh, watercolor and white better. And it, it keeps your, what are your airbrush a little bit cleaner. It's not as hard to clean. I just rinse it under the water later on, or I just take it into my bucket of water here, pour it out and then just spray it while it's in there. And it's not going to dry hard like the acrylic will. If you do use acrylic in your airbrush, make sure that you really spray it out well. And so that is um, circles of confusion. I uh, just wanted to give you that little heads up on how to use them and why to use them. Use them when you want to make the background look somewhat out of focus, um, like a photographer would. And it's a kind of a neat way of getting dimension in your work and even a little little design sense so that it looks kind of cool. You know, that these are lights back there and it's just something that you can maybe your, your style, you can add to your style. All right. And so until next, next Tuesday, when I do these um, newsletter videos, um, you can always sign up for my newsletter at beckerart.net. And I also do a paint along every Thursday. And so on YouTube, so subscribe my, 
subscribe to my YouTube channel and you can get all paint along with me every Thursday at 630 or watch it and then paint along at another time and then post it on my Facebook page group, which is called Becker Art Group. And so we can, if you need some help and all this is free and all this is just to help you out and teach you how to do watercolor and water media really well. All right. So until next tip, we'll see you then. Thanks and bye-bye.